All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Philip Osteen. I am the Dean of the University of Utah College of Social Work, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you today to Men's Mental Health Matters, which is the first presentation in our 2023-2024 Grand Challenges for Social Work series. We welcome all of our virtual attendees um, locally and from around the world, and we thank you for making the time to join us either today live or watching this recording sometime in the future. We express our sincere gratitude to each and every one of you who donated while registering. Um, please know that uh, all of these donations will directly go to Benefit College of Social Work students who are working in mental and behavioral health. Thank you for your generosity. The Grand Challenges for Social Work began taking shape in 2013 as a groundbreaking project to champion social progress powered by science. It continues a decade later as a national call to, to action for our field's practitioners and researchers, specifically to harness social work science and knowledge base, collaborate with individuals, community-based organizations, and professionals from all fields and disciplines, and to work together to tackle prevalent social harms. Before we get to the presentation, on behalf of the College of Social Work, I wanna recognize our American Indian and indigenous community members by acknowledging that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the endearing relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their ancestral homelands. We respect the sovereign relationships between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So today we are going to be diving into issues around men's mental health and well-being. And um, I want to make sure that individuals understand that some of this material um, will get heavy and we will be talking about suicide ideation and suicide behavior. So I want you to know that in advance, and I want to encourage you at any time, if you feel you need to step away from the video or take a break, please feel comfortable doing so. It will be available to you at a later time. But also know that there are many resources available, including you can reach out to me, um, and we have our national hotline at 988. So please take care of yourselves, and if we can provide some support during that process, don't hesitate to reach out. We have two hours today uh, together, and we're going to begin with Dr. Derek Iwamoto, who will give us some context for mental health challenges that are specific to men. Um, we know as we work with different groups, there are often uh, contextual factors that we really need to take into account to understand and develop effective evidence-based practices to help individuals with their well-being. Um, and he will provide some great, great context for that. Following him, Mr. Lorenzo Lewis will discuss his advocacy work to meet clients where they are and engage men in mental health discussions in a very surprising way. And last, Dr. Jody Jacobson Fry will review her research into how a creative online mental health platform is improving help seeking behaviors for men. Finally, then, our presenters are going to join me for a panel discussion and have an opportunity to answer all of your questions. We look forward to that, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit any questions that you might have for them individually and or as a panel, and we'll make sure that we get to those. So we're honored to have our three guests today who will share their own stories and research about the challenges of men facing mental health struggles. Dr. Derek Iwamoto is an associate professor and co-director of training in the Counseling Psychology Program at the University of Maryland, College Park's Department of Psychology. Prior to his faculty position, he completed a National Institute of Drug Abuse postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine. His work includes identifying distinct subgroups of Asian Americans who engage in heavy episodic drinking and report alcohol-related problems at similar rates as white Americans. He identifies key gender-relevant factors, including distinct masculine norms that heighten risk of alcohol-related problems among men and demonstrating how explicit racial discrimination directly and indirectly relates to alcohol-related problems among Asian Americans. And with that, Dr. Iwamoto, take it away. All right, thank you. All right, let's... PowerPoint is taking a little time to load up. 
All right. So everybody can see. Well, first, I, I really want to thank um, the University of to be here today, as well as like present uh, in front of all of you, as well as with my esteemed colleagues. Hey, Derek, I apologize for interrupting, but your PowerPoint is no longer sharing. Okay. Hold on. Let's... Technology may not be your friend today. Okay. Let's, let's try this again. And once you go ahead and see if you can go into slideshow mode, let's see if yeah. we can do that. All right, can you see it now? On our end, it's not moving into slideshow. Can you advance your slides? Let's see if we can see that when you do that. We are not seeing that happen. So can you see the, the slides on your computer, Derek, just fine? Or is he frozen now? I think he's frozen. Danielle, why don't we do this? Um, and Mr. Lewis, if you're ready, why don't we switch to you and have you start out and then we'll work with Derek uh, to get his technology up. How does that sound? No problem. We'll do it. Look forward to it. And I'll just tell Derek that real quick. Derek, we're going to go ahead and, and have Mr. Lewis go while you look at the technology. Right. Um, because it's just being wonky, which it always is in every single meeting we ever have, right? So we'll be we'll be back to you shortly. Take it away, Mr. Lewis. All righty. So I am Lorenzo Lewis. And again, thank you so much to um, such an esteemed group of people for inviting me to share this conversation, I hope everyone sees my screen. I so happily was scrolling through my presentation. So I used something very similar. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I presented at the uh, <clears throat> Substance Abuse and Human and Health Social Services Division in Delaware. And um, nevertheless, it was an amazing experience. And so I, I would like to go ahead and jump in um, just with a, a brief introduction about me. So I'm Lorenzo Lewis, and I am the founder of the Confess Project of America. Um, all right, so I'm going <laughs> to slow my slides down, but um, I always tell people, and I'll start off with this story about my journey, um, born in jail to an incarcerated mother, and face challenges of you know, depression and different societal challenges as a young person. Um, found myself incarcerated at the age of 17 um, for really you know, um, I, a lot of lot, most of it was my environment, um, the people that I was around, the things that I grew up seeing um, really impacted my um, day to day life, my day to day, day walk. Um, and so that was my first introduction to mental health. Um, I'll never forget at the age of 10 that I found myself in a behavior health facility. Um, and at the time, it was just known that I was just an angry child that was trying to find my way. But however, it was actually an early um early symptoms of depression and anxiety um, that just had turned into impulsivity and anger and really had turned into rage. And so that was my first introduction to my mental health journey. And obviously coming from a family of people who struggled and had different challenges as well. Um, you know, my mother, my father, my cousins, um, I really uh, had no idea that this would be my calling, to be honest. This was something that I ran away from uh, most of my life. Um, something that I, my community did not um, associate with really well uh, because the stigma of mental health and what I did learn later on is, is that was quite normal for my community to associate with mental health not being related to them, being ashamed of talking about mental health, being ashamed of talking about the challenges of being, you know, vulnerable or being exposed was the language, you know. And so, um, 
you know, I, um, two years after my release, I went into, um, um, uh, I was, you know, in college. I was, you know, looking to better myself. And I was offered a job working in a juvenile justice facility. How ironic is three years later after my release, I served as working as a juvenile justice correction officer. And I did that for about two years. And the one most interesting thing is that I saw the younger version of myself um, that really was, um, I think, really compelling. And that really was my call to action. And um, so I, the next nine years, I spent working in private behavior health facilities and clinical facilities, um, working with young people and adults um, that had severe, you know, mental health and that experience, you know, psychiatric illnesses. And so as I really, you know, started to talk about my personal journey, I think it's also important to segue that, you know, um, I was really putting this work again because of my own personal experience. But also as I go back to my, my earlier journey, of um, spending time in my aunt's beauty salon. And the reason why that's so important, the time that I spent in my aunt's beauty salon is the reason today that I'm able to even share with you some of the data, some of the statistics, some of the great things that we've been able to do nationally in our work is because I was um, set inside of a, a place that I called the village and saw people from every walk of life, regardless of socioeconomic background to talk about different things that they were dealing with uh, while getting their hair done, while getting a haircut. Um, i never forget being five years old and getting off the school bus every day and being frustrated because I wanted to go home and play video games and I couldn't because I was too young and I want, and I had to sit in my aunt's beauty salon. And so that in itself really uh, was a training ground for the work that I do today is, uh, and it introduces the Confess Project of America. What is the Confess Project? It is um, America's uh, first mental health awareness movement that focuses on training barbers and stylists to be mental health advocates. Um, it really explores the uh, suicidal, um, you know, challenges around um, black men and boys dying by suicide and their families. In addition to, um, it also addresses components in regards to the stigma of mental health. Um, you know, and, and I'm going to get into some of our research that we've done with Harvard University to investigate further how our work plays a huge role in mitigating domestic violence and in and even interpersonal community violence. Um, and so the Confess Project of America is an advocacy organization um, that was um, started in 2016 in Little Rock, Arkansas. And since then, we have transitioned our work um, to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and a lot of it is, again, uh, my own story, my my journey, but recognizing that the, the public health challenges uh, within our community, when you think about the 4% of psychiatrists that identify as people of color, when we think about the mental health workforce gaps for clinicians and African-Americans and how that gap is tremendous and how barbers and stylists can truly be um, a reckoning force in changing the landscape of how mental health services look in America and even across the globe. Um, we have been grateful to train over now 3,200 barbers and stylists in a framework um, that I will jump into um, across 53 cities in 30 states. Um, and we have, um, I haven't specifically been to Utah, but I'm sure it maybe had a, the time is right, we will. <laughs> uh, but we've been a, a lot of places um, and we're excited to continue to grow and to, to do more as well. Um, our foundation really sits in four areas is access, advocacy, research, and utilizing innovation. Um, this is not the specific training that we work with barbers on. I will cover the four key areas of how we train barbers and how it looks. Um, in addition, um, I believe um, um, Danielle will be sharing the link to our research that was done with Harvard University that really talks. And I'm also going to also dive into a pilot study um, that we did with Georgia State University that really talks about some of our outcomes and some of the um, the evidence that we're uh, capturing in this work as well. But we really look at, you know, um, when we're going to communities and going inside of barbershops and salons, we're looking at how do we help bridge access 
Um, that's one of our foundations. Um, um, how do we continue to use research best practices? How are we using empirical data um, to increase our outcomes? Um, how do we utilize advocacy? How do we partner with public policy um, um, leaders in our community? <laughs> How do we partner with uh, media, uh, working with influencers? Um, how do we how do we utilize social media? How do we utilize um, all the great platforms? Like we've been featured in you know Oprah Magazine and the Kelly Clarkson Show, ABC, CNN. Like how do we use these as ways of creating and now a narrative that is consistent, um, where um, African Americans can see themselves getting the help that they deserve. And, and, and also to feeling seen, loved, and heard while that's happening in the process. Um, and obviously, um, utilizing innovation. Um, the curriculum itself um, is really tied to innovation. And I will um, uh, talk about a few points inside of the curriculum itself, and I'm sorry it's not listed here um, on this on this survey, but I would challenge everyone that's here to please visit the Confess Project of America.org, uh, where it really just dives a lot deeper into um, some of our videos, uh, some of our testimonials. Um, but nevertheless, the training itself is really a uh, reflection of active listening. Um, and how we utilize active listening as a tool, as four tools, um, active listening, how barbers can utilize active listening um, as a way of supporting their clients every day that may be just going through life challenges. Validation, um, how do a barber or stylist that sees 20 to 25 people, we've done the math, we recognize that about 20 to 25 people per week are going inside of a barbershop and a salon. That's about 100 people, new and existing clients, um, in a month. So that's going inside of these places and we're offering resources and we're offering, and the barbers are using these tools that I'm listening to you right now. The third tool is positive communication. And again, if you want to see more of these videos, please visit the Confess Project of America where you can learn and see more of these videos that we break down. Um, positive communication, how do we, you know, we train them to positively communicate in a way that uplifts the client, right? Um, and then lastly is stigma reduction. How do um, how do these gatekeepers, right? We call them gatekeepers. And in the research uh, with Harvard University, is they're recognized as suicide prevention and mental health gatekeepers. How do these how do gatekeepers help to reduce the stigma of mental health? That's one by educating them um, about what is mental health, like how. Uh, what does that mean? What is mental illness? Um, what are, um, how does sign and symptoms may um, be important to where someone can navigate and find out more? Um, and then also, how do we position these gatekeepers to deploying information? Um, one cool thing that we do do in our work is every second and fourth Monday of the month, we do um, um, focus groups um, where beyond this training, they're attending a focus group and they're getting more education and training to be a mental health advocate. So we're training them to be an advocate, um, a more of a peer support, very early intervention um, that can help to change lives. And, and obviously um, some of the, um, um, the impact that we've seen is you know, um, on one hand, we we went to Philadelphia and we we trained a group of barbers, and you know there was a, a gentleman there that um, months prior never went through our training. Um, said that a client came to sit in his chair and said that this would be my last haircut, and at that time he had no idea <laughs> of how to react in that situation. Um, the client um, experienced a psychotic episode and went missing. Um, and so he was not armed with mental health resources, not knowing how to, you know, get in contact with 911 or 988, you know, to, to be able to deploy the proper um, opportunities to help this person. Um, luckily, this individual did not pass, um, but he, in that moment, um, would, did not have the necessary skills and tools. And better yet, on another testimonial, we trained a group of barber school students in Tennessee, about 40 of them. And um, probably two weeks after leaving that training, very similar situation. Um, someone sat down in a barber chair and said that they didn't want to live any longer, that when they walked out of there, they were walking in front of a, a moving train. And so when you think about, in that moment, 
that barber had priorly had had our training, had been impacted with recognizing the impact and was able to get that person to a therapist, was able to get um, the proper personnel to getting that individual the help that they deserve. Two very similar situations, but two very different outcomes. <laughs> and so as I talk about outcomes, I'm going to flip my screen over to um, the um, the research, the pilot study that we produced last year with the Georgia Health Policy Center um, that really examines some of the points of our um, research that we was that was funded by um, the Department of Behavioral Health in the state of Georgia. Um, and as as I scroll through, I'm just going to pull out a, a few um, points of the research and the importance of it, and some of the the results that we've been able to um, to do. And so, you know, there was about uh, um, a thousand barbers who participated um, um, about, you know, across um, the metro Atlanta counties um, that's listed here. Um, you know, it, you know, it, it also, again, talks about the four key components of the training that I just discussed, you know, positive communication, active listening, validation and reducing mental health stigma. And as we dive deeper into some of the, um, and I can make this available. Um, I'm just, again, trying to be conscious of time, but I can make this available um, to providing this if anyone wants to look more deeply into uh, some of the, the feedback that we, that we did get during the training. So 97.5% of them thought the training was helpful and informative. Um, and obviously, as we may see some of the other reflections that 90% of them will be willing to receive more training um, on being a good advocate. 85% um, of those reported that the training offered enough time, activities, and information to prepare them to be an advocate. Um, and so these were some of the open-ended questions that were included in the pre and post surveys. Obviously, it talks about ways that the training was beneficial and ways that it could have been better, right? Food and snacks, we can make the training longer, provide more information. Um, since we have had this now, we have revamped our virtual training to now being actually two days long instead of one day, two days and a half. Um, we have already made some changes to uh, making sure that we're uh, providing hospitality in a way, whether that's working with uh, corporate and uh, community sponsors. Um, and obviously, just some of the things that they really enjoy about, about the training as well is, is listed here to the left. Um, and obviously, you know, talking about the level of comfort and discussing mental health, um, you know, it's, you know, relatively shows 90%. Um, you know, comfortable with talking to clients about mental health, you know, the barbers itself and 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 also the, you know, attitudes and beliefs of being a mental health advocate is uh, a trained barber, good person to talk to a client about mental health issues, about 92%. So as you can tell that there is a lot of great uh, feedback uh, that we've had. Uh, the, the program has been going now again for seven years. And uh, we're really dedicated to utilizing, um, you know, this research as a part of how we um, continue to make a difference. Well, I know we're here today to talk about men's mental health, and I want to dive deeply into <clears throat> why, um, in particular, the community that we serve, African-American men, well, um, you know, uh, do not think that they uh, care to have mental health care. Um, that is something that's very common. Um, as I kind of talked about my earlier journey, um, a lot of it is um, a lot of it is religious. You know, uh, some of it is uh, societal. To be honest, um, you know, just feeling that it's just something that doesn't apply to us um, um, can handle their problems on their own. Uh, Sixty-four percent said that, and that's very true. Um, and I believe a lot of that is because the you know racial uh, <clears throat> the the uh, races, racial challenges that African Americans have faced, um, as well as just um, the the different societal challenges, um, in, in many ways, um, and even all the way when you just think about some of the systemic challenges um, of why you know we can handle it on our own. Um, 
think that they will be judged by therapists or other people. Uh, this is very true. Um, this is, you know, one of the other reasons why um, African American men do not seek care, um, not comfortable, you know, talking to strangers about their problems and don't think it will help. And even though there was 58 percent of that said they don't think it will help, that number is probably higher in some regards. Um, I like to always say that the work that we do is very um, instrumental because it's really providing a space that's just never been available. And so when you think about barbershops, it's an institution that even in historical as the civil rights era has been known to make social change. When you think about civic participation, voting, um, some of the things that's been done through barbershops, um, the way that, you know, in the earlier days, you know, barbers were seen as as doctors almost in a sense of providing, um, you know, skin care, um, more um, um, hygienic care, you know, to their clients. And so, um, you know, those are just a few few things of why we have chosen a staple in, a, in an area where we know that there are challenges um, with mental health particularly within the African-American community. Well, we know that suicide is the third leading cause of death for African-American men between the ages of 18 and 24. And so this model is really uh, congruent with um, changing that as well as, um, again, um, serving as a mechanism for um, interpersonal community violence, um, as well as um, just societal challenges that um, communities could be facing. So I will make this study um, available. Again, it's pretty loaded, um, as well as the link to the Harvard research has been shared. Um, so feel free to you know, learn more about our work and the Confess Project of America. And I'm really, again, grateful uh, for this opportunity to be able to to be able to speak about men's mental health. Um, I'm someone personally um, that still uh, attends and sees a therapist, even while doing this work of traveling all over the country, many cities, I mm -hmm. truly believe that it is um, the reason that I'm able to continue doing this. Um, and so I'm um, someone who personally believes that the importance of, of, of why this is also important to share with other people through our model. So, um, Thanks again to um, Dr. Austin and the team for um, you, you guys' support. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lewis. Um, I, I think it's just fascinating. And as you were talking, I'm thinking, who are other groups of sort of these community-based gatekeepers, right? Like, and like bartenders. I mean, people who often see people in a, in a setting where they may be able to, to recognize emotional distress or things or where there's a relationship to start. I mean, it's, it's a very innovative. I think it's a great product project. Um, I did want to make sure, even though you talked about it yourself, that I give you your full introduction, which I forgot to do before you started. So let me run through that real quick. So Mr. Lewis is the founder and former chief visionary officer of the Confess Project of America, a national grassroots uh, movement that empowers barbers to become mental health advocates for men of color. In the barbershop, he witnessed the intersections of poverty and violence and learned that people need more support. Building upon the work he has done over the past 15 years, Mr. Lewis is now dedicated to the empowerment, wealth building, and wellness of others. His passion to help underserved groups led him to partner with Crown Cuts Academy founder Craig Charles to create Uplift Barber and Beauty Academy, the first barber school in the country that incorporates mental health and entrepreneurship into the curriculum. Additionally, his parent nonprofit, l j Empowerment, is focused on juvenile justice and workforce development. Thank you so much, sir, for being here and look forward to having uh, more conversation in the panel. Now we're going to go back to our friend, Dr. Iwamato. How are you feeling over there? Good? Have to unmute. unmute All right. Phone. So, yes. Let me see if I could start the PowerPoint in. If I don't have, if this PowerPoint doesn't work, I'm going to switch it to the PDF file. Can you see me, see it now, the PowerPoint? We see the PowerPoint, but not in slideshow mode. So I don't know if you put it in slideshow mode yet. Uh, yeah, on my end it does, but wait. wait.
All right. So you know what I'm going to do? I am just going to Um, hold on. Sorry, everybody. Gotta love technology. Um, technology. That's just the way it is. Yeah. All right. And so we, even, we tried it out before and it worked great. Yeah, I know. We just started this and I, I really want to do this because I, uh, can you see me? Can you see the power person? Uh, can you see the presentation now? A PDF? Maybe. Is that what we're seeing? No, I think we're still seeing the notes page. I think he might have froze again. We well, you know what that means then, Dr. Fry. You're up. Are you ready? Um, I am. I'm not sure if I can screen share while it's frozen. I'll try. I can't. The other person has to stop screen sharing. Um, the other option is you could maybe as host um, stop the screen share from Derek. All right. Thank you. All right. Do you want to do an introduction while I set up the slide? I do want to do an introduction. Uh, for those of you who may not know, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Fry for more than a decade uh, now in this work around men's uh, health and well-being in terms of training and suicide intervention and prevention. And it's just a real delight to have you here. So Dr. Jody Jackson Fry is a professor and associate dean for research at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. She chairs the Social Work in the Workplace and Employee Assistance Subspecialization and is the founder and faculty executive director of the recently launched Behavioral Health and Wellbeing Lab. She is co-chair of the University of Maryland Mental Health and Addiction Health Disparities Think Tank at the School of Medicine. Dr. Fry also co-chairs the Workplace Suicide Prevention and Postvention Committee, where she's contributing as a leader in the development and dissemination of the national guidelines for workplace suicide prevention. Dr. Fry's research focuses on workplace behavioral health, and she has dedicated a significant portion of her research and advocacy work to suicide prevention, mental health, substance use and recovery, and the intersection of the workplace with attention to social determinants of health and well-being. Dr. Fry, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Osteen. Thank you, University of Utah, for supporting this work and for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel. Um, thank you, Mr. Lewis, for starting us off. Um, very excited always to hear about community-based efforts and um, some of our work has actually been in barbershops too. So really exciting to hear about that work. So I'm gonna um, talk for about 20 minutes about research um, on man therapy and introduce the audience to what man therapy is, give you some snippets in terms of some of the research and talk a little bit about our community-based partnerships that we're doing. Um, I think it's important to frame this work in terms of looking at um, the public health problem of suicide. And I'm just really, um, I'm really happy to see so many people joining today because some of the hope that we talk about in suicide prevention has to do with reducing stigma and reaching more people so that we're more comfortable talking about this topic and we're more comfortable helping people to connect with resources, with their family, with their peers, and with professionals. So having over 200 people on the call today um, really is a, a good outcome in terms of our overall group efforts in this country to reduce suicide. Um, unfortunately, we have seen recently in our CDC data another increase. Um, there was a slight decrease overall, but not equally um, throughout populations and demographics in the U.S. during COVID about suicide death, but the death rates have increased. And I'm going to talk with you today about working aged men, and in particular, many of them white men continue to have very high rates of suicide. And I just want to preface that, um, again, looking at different ways to connect and to reach out to populations in the community is essential. And it's important to know that a cookie cutter approach to suicide prevention isn't gonna work. Um, so I'm gonna talk with you about some strategies to reach out to working aged men. Um, and also in terms of what um, strategies might be appropriate for other populations that you're hearing about today. 
So in Utah, um, where we're talking about, one of the reasons that we focus on working aged men has to do with lethality. You can see here that 80% of suicides in Utah were death by firearm. So I've, I'm a clinical social worker and um, have always worked in male dominated workplaces and workspaces. Um, and a lot of times we don't have an opportunity to talk with someone after an attempt because of the lethality of the suicide attempt. So I'm very much an advocate of pushing things upstream as much as possible in suicide prevention to try to prevent getting from the time of crisis and intensity um, at an attempt. Because a lot of times, especially we know with men, we don't have a second opportunity to talk about reasons for living or what might help to prevent them from feeling that intense moment of a suicidal crisis in the future. So some of you um, may be familiar with man therapy. Those of you that are in the Utah audience, you actually do um, promote man therapy throughout the state. Um, but not everybody on the call here is familiar with man therapy. And 10 years ago, I wasn't familiar with man therapy. Um, so I thought I would introduce you a little bit to what man therapy is. Um, it was created in Colorado um, from Grit Digital Health in collaboration with um, the Colorado uh, Violence Prevention Organizations and experts on suicide prevention. And it's based on research about what men want. Um, as a clinical social worker, working with a lot of different men, I, I wasn't necessarily trained uh, to think about gender specific ways to connect with different people. I was taught one way to do clinical social work and just assume that would work with everybody. And it didn't. And a lot of times we know that men are often, you know, what we think of in, as double jeopardy populations where they're really hard to reach and engage in mental health services. And they also are at very high risk oftentimes for suicide and other mental health and substance use um, problems. So how do we think about different strategies? You know, one way that researchers and community-based researchers approach this is to ask them, you know, what, what would it take to engage in conversation about mental health and suicide prevention? And so researchers out in Colorado and with Grit Digital Health, um, they talked to men and they came up with man therapy based on what men wanted. So I'm going to show you a real quick video to introduce you to this and then share some research and best practices that we're learning from doing this work. Hello, I'm Dr. Rich Mahogany. Welcome to Man Therapy. The situation was dire. Suicide among working age men was on the rise across the US and there were no public service campaigns that specifically or effectively addressed men and their mental health needs. To make an impact on this complex issue, Cactus needed to invent a whole new approach, one that would reach men on their terms so that we could redesign their beliefs and behaviors about seeking help for their men for their mental health. Our research found key belief and behavior challenges to be addressed. Most men believe talking about their feelings and their mental health was perceived as weak and unmanly. And when it comes to behavior, guys said that when they did have a mental health need, what they wanted most were tools they could use to try and fix it themselves, just like a car engine. And in order to reach men before it was too late, we needed to go upstream. We needed to get men talking about and working on their mental health needs before they were actually in crisis. We needed a sharp idea. We needed men to believe taking care of their mental health was manly, like hitting the gym for your brain. So we created man therapy. Therapy the way a man does it. More than merely an ad campaign, Man Therapy is a first of its kind interactive digital therapy platform. At mantherapy.org, men meet fictional psychologist, Dr. Rich Mahogany. When a man faces a serious life problem like divorce, depression, or suicidal thoughts, shouldn't a man have a way to deal with that too? Well, now he's done. I'm Dr. Rich Mahogany. Visit me at mantherapy.org. To get guys to visit the site, we had to talk to guys like guys talk to guys, using humor to break the ice, shrink stigma, and get men thinking about, talking about, and addressing their mental health needs. It's psychology served with a side of bacon. We deployed the campaign in places where we knew we'd be grabbing our audience's undivided attention. We also partnered with Facebook. Using predictive analytics, we were able to serve man therapy content to guys who showed signs of approaching a mental health crisis. And it's worked. 
So far, more than 1 million men have visited the site. 375,000 have taken the head inspection, and more than 36,000 men have clicked the crisis button to get immediate help. In addition, a four-year, $1.2 million CDC-sponsored clinical study in the state of Michigan showed clear evidence that man therapy helps reduce suicide among working-age men. The campaign has been licensed in multiple states, as well as Australia. It's been written about in the New York Times, named Ad Age's Pro Bono Campaign of the Year, and presented at South by Southwest. By far, our most meaningful results are the emails, voicemails, and handwritten notes we've received from guys around the world, letting us know that man therapy literally saved their lives. Hurry up, man, pick a therapy. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about behind the scenes of that research. And to be honest, as um, a researcher, I'm not connected to man therapy. I'm not paid by man therapy. I didn't create man therapy. I stumbled upon man therapy as a workplace suicide prevention researcher, wondering what are some other ways and tactics to reach these guys that we're not reaching through our regular mental health messaging and our public health campaigns. And I was a little skeptical. I thought, well, it seems popular, but is it really helping? So I entered, um, I was privileged to be awarded a grant through the CDC to look at the effectiveness of man therapy. And you'll see some familiar names on here. Um, Dean Osteen <laughs> was on our um, project team. So as he mentioned, we've worked together a long time. Um, also Derek was part of our team and helping to write up some of our results. And I'm excited to hear his presentation. And there were lots of different partners. This was truly a community-based effort is we really worked with um, folks all throughout the state of Michigan where the first study took place. So what we were trying to do with man therapy, it's a public health campaign. You saw a little, some clips of it online. It's a self-paced um, project online. It's free and available to anyone. Different states and organizations can license it. And then that gives you an opportunity to work hand in hand with Grit Digital Health on some data analytics and reporting um, and really diving deep into how we do some high tech promotion of man therapy throughout the community. But we wanted to know, does it really make a difference with suicidal ideation and depression and with help seeking behavior. So we did a five year study and we were really successful based on our partnerships with our boots on the ground partners that were out there promoting what we called at the time Healthy Men Michigan was our campaign. And it was a way to bring men to a online website to do anonymous screening for depression and suicide and anger, and also look at help seeking and follow up with them over the course of three months to see did man therapy really make a difference in helping with their mental health. So we screened thousands of men throughout the state. Many of them were at pretty high risk for both depression and suicide. And we enrolled over 550 um, over the course of three months. So it was a very large randomized controlled trial. Let me just tell you, it wasn't easy to recruit working aged men ages 25 to 64. First, getting them to the website took all the resources that we had to really start a public health campaign from scratch as a grassroots organizing project. We had a really nice representation of men throughout the state. 20% of our population were men of color, which in Michigan, it was primarily uh, Black and Latino. We also had another 20% of our population that identified as gay, bisexual, or queer. So the results found some good um, overall findings for screening. First of all, we've never had a study of this type that actually looked at anonymous screening and connections with resources. So men in both of our groups, the group that received our basic depression screening, which was like our control group, and then our group that received that plus looking at man therapy improved with suicide ideation and depression over time. When we dug a little bit deeper as a pilot study into our man therapy group, we found that men that were using man therapy also reported reduced um, number of poor mental health days throughout that three months, improved social support and motivation to seek treatment. And despite the name being man therapy, it's not a replacement for therapy. So as a public health scientist, I really see the true benefit of this is breaking through stigma and connecting to help seeking. So we tested that as well. And we looked at specifically motivation to seek treatment. Did man therapy, you know, encourage you to talk to a mental health professional over time? And we found some really good results. So when we dug a little bit deeper into our randomized control trial data, we found in fact, men that looked at man therapy and used that over time reported statistically significant improved um, behaviors in terms of professional help seeking compared to men in our control group that received the basic screening and referral to resources. 
To me, this is the most powerful outcome of the study because what we found is that man therapy actually is an important tool to have in your toolbox to break through those barriers and encourage help seeking. And in this study, which you can um, see the links here, and I, if Erica is on the chat, she might be putting some links in there so you can access the studies yourself. But we defined uh, formal help seeking as talking with a doctor about mental health, meeting with a mental health professional, and also using online chat. So we had an opportunity to interview some of the men that were in our study. And what we found is that it really had an impact with stigma. And a couple quotes up here, um, this person we interviewed said, it's just a really nice to know there's a place for us to go, a safe environment with other men that we know about. The sense of breaking down social isolation and building connection is such an important aspect of suicide prevention. So if we're able to do this with a free online website, we really need to think about building this into our overall programs of suicide prevention. Another person that we interviewed talked about stigma, that it's built up and it explains how to take the bricks away. We did a lot of promotion with partners. Um, we had a, a pretty big campaign in Michigan with Eric Hippel, who was a former um, Lions quarterback who struggled himself with suicide ideation and trauma and is now spokesman, spokesperson for uh, mental health with men. Um, and we were on the TV once and, and this person we interviewed saw Eric and I talking and he said it helped to open up my eyes to realize I have these things and it doesn't make me a bad person. So really connecting to see men that look like them that were struggling, but also go, building through the struggle to hope and resilience um, was such a motivator for the men that used our um, the man therapy website. So what we found is that it's important to do high touch and high tech. We did a lot, as you saw in the video, with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, but we also built up our partnerships throughout the community. So it was spread by word of mouth, through wallet cards, through posters and flyers. And I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing now. It was so successful. The CDC funded Michigan in a five-year grant going on now. Um, that's called PRISM, which is Preventing Suicide in Michigan Men. And along with Grit Digital Health and the University of Maryland, we are um, key partners in the public health aspects of the PRISM project to reduce suicide amongst working aged men over the next five years. And our, our project continues to grow. We stopped the Healthy Men Michigan in 2020 with 230 community partners. And just within the first two years of launching, we have, I think, over 600 partners now. That is such a critical part is to make things local and responsive to the community that you're trying to meet. We work closely with all our partners to prepare um, materials to make them shovel ready so they can easily use them in presentations, in community campaigns. And we also this time in this project have created data dashboards that I wanna share with you because I think it's an important responsibility of community-based researchers to think about how to make data transparent and shareable with your partners. So we recently surveyed our partners in Michigan that are using man therapy and asked them, you know, different ways that they're promoting and how they're using materials from our Google Drive. Um, but what I really wanna hone in on here is on the bottom right, 40% of our partners who accessed our data dashboard are using their own data that's available 24 seven live. They don't have to wait for that peer reviewed paper to come out um, and they're using it in their own presentations and grant proposals. So to me, this is a very exciting development um, in the research where people can go onto their dashboard. It's more complicated than this snapshot, but this is a little bit about the data they get. How many unique website users are coming to the site and what pages are they looking at? And are they completing the 20 point head inspection, which is the man therapy version of a clinical assessment? What topics are they searching and are they using the red crisis line that connects to the 988 suicide um, crisis lifeline? These are, um, these are data for all of Michigan, but we actually have broken it down so that our partners can search by county. So if they're having an out of the darkness walk for suicide prevention, or maybe a workplace has been promoting this at a wellness fair, and they wanna see you know, what's the outcome of doing this local promotion, they can log on anytime, day or night, and access their direct data for their county. 
this is an example of um, one of the regions in Michigan. There, there are eight different regions we work with based on the Department of Homeland Security definitions. And in 2021, this was right before we went live with the Man Therapy Michigan Current Campaign. And you can see in one year of doing the outreach with our community partners, coupled with the high tech, a 50% increase in new unique users coming to the Man Therapy site. So I can't stress enough the importance of not just relying on online, but really coupling that and making it local and community responsive. And this is an example in that region. Barb Smith um, is a huge presenter. She builds man therapy into all of her crisis intervention and suicide prevention trainings. And she printed some koozies and uses bathroom ads. Um, and what we found actually with some of our campaign materials, like our bathroom ads, where we add QR codes, is that accounts for 20% of all the QR scans throughout the state. So thinking about like, where do people receive and read about sensitive information, stigmatized material, we really want to be creative and work with our partners to think about how to get that information to those who need it most. I'm going to skip this video for time. And um, just show you a couple, I wanna show you one other video that we're doing. Um, different ways that we make it easy for our partners to get involved. Um, you can also go to the Man Therapy website. Again, for those of you that haven't heard of it, I would encourage you to spend some time exploring. We found that um, men, women, all, all folks, you know, really get different types of benefits from using the Man Therapy site um, and sharing it with others. These are some examples of what we create in our Google slide as part of the public health arm of the campaign that we make flyers and wallet cards. We also make customized materials. So we've been doing quite a bit of work right now in the construction area where suicide rates are the highest for all industries um, throughout the United States. And you can see here on um, sticker on a hard hat, we've made a toolbox talk for how to build this into a safety um, talk in the morning. So really trying to think creatively about how to get that information out to your population. Oops, I lost my cursor. Let's see, where did we go? And then this is just one example that I'll end with. This was one of our partners had a community event and just with a simple iPhone and a flyer, um, they filmed some people in their community that we helped to make a video to share to really bring suicide prevention down to a local level. So I'll share that with you. I like to listen to music for my mental health. For my mental health, I like to spend time with friends and family on the beach and go camping during the summer and skiing during the winter. I like to take my dog for a walk for my mental health. Uh, for my mental health, I like to hang out with friends and family, uh, go to the beach and uh, play some sports, especially tennis. And that's what I do for my mental health. <laughs> So again, really simple techniques, ways to grab folks' attention, both online, on billboards, on flyers, and community events. The more ways that we brand this and reduce the stigma, the more people that we're reaching that are going to find help. Um, we always talk about um, man therapy, you know, that that taking care of your mental health is a manly thing to do. Um, one of the other taglines I use a lot is you can't fix your mental health with duct tape. Um, it's really amazing how different strategies break down the barriers of communication that some of us trained as clinicians and providers haven't really been able to tackle or to think about how to open up the door for conversation. So as a researcher, um, I've definitely been won over by man therapy throughout the years of being able to study it. Um, and I found that it's really touched a lot of lives and families to um, give them a second chance. So thanks for letting me present today and I'll stop my screen share. Thanks, Dr. Fry. Uh, I can remember, you know, what, five, six years ago, this was like, like, who would have thought that something like this, right, would be on the horizon, and now it becomes more and more um, sort of standard when we think about these different ways to reach out to men and hard to reach groups. 
I want to encourage the audience to please, if you have questions for the presenters, uh, put them in the Q&A button so that we can make sure that we get to those when we move on to the panel. Dr. Iwamoto. All right. So, Danielle, can you please pull up my PDF? All right. Great. So, um, yeah, welcome, everybody. Again, I really want to thank um, Dean Osteen, as well as the University of Utah so uh, College of Social Work for you know, letting me present today. It's definitely a huge honor. So next slide. So I'm going to just give a, just a brief overview. Um, first, like talking about like my own challenges uh, with respect to masculinity, but also talk about how masculinity is a public health issue. I'm also going to be discussing within group differences. Uh, as well as some psychological theories that might help explain this strain and, and present some empirical evidence linking masculinity with mental health. And finally, the translational application. So I want to first like, give like a story about when I was driving recently to the University of Maryland, and that's the top screen. Forget like, yeah, sorry about like all the little screenshots. I had all this animation, but I think that's why this thing crashed. Um, but anyways, I was going driving to University of Maryland um, and as I was driving, I was coming up to this exit and then there was like a turn and then the straightaway. And when I was on the straightaway, I noticed the car coming, speeding up behind me. And I was like, whoa, what is going on? And they were just tailgating me. And I just was, geez, what is this person doing? They started swerving. And finally, um, given that there was a 180 degree turn, I knew we had like slowed down. I just tapped on the brakes twice slightly. Um, but that was a really bad decision because that agitated the guy behind me. He swerved around me and it was just a single lane. He went on the uh, shoulder, passed me up, slammed on his brakes a couple times, stuck his head out, started swearing at me, giving the one finger salute. Um, and that was just, yeah, so that's what happened. Um, and we both actually are going to this intersection and luckily, next, um, yeah, next slide. Um, you know, nothing happened, but just like the the fear and just the the look, the the disdain, the anger. Um, and actually, the last screen kind of showed the Tesla guy. There's like a Tesla guy that went viral right here. Thank you. Um, that look, that same guy like who I encountered had that look. Um, which definitely like shook me to the core. Next slide. And, oh, actually, yeah, one back. And so that's actually the car uh, that did the swerving. Um, so we were at the intersection. Fortunately, um, there was a reaction. I felt this reaction that I wanted to curse back. I wanted to give him the finger. Um, I wanted to honk at him, but just given that look, I just felt like, again, I'm, my life might be threatened. Is this guy gonna shoot me? And that's why I actually took the picture. Uh, just because I was like, man, is something going to happen? But fortunately, I didn't react. This rationale, the psychologist rationale said like, you know what? It's not worth it. Um, and so we both went on our merrily ways. I mean, I'm sure both of us were agitated. I know I was, but I'm just glad that it didn't escalate into something else. Next slide. And so this is really ind indicative of uh, a gender issue. Um, specifically, we're talking about road rage and violence. Uh, we have seen this uptick in road rage over the past, since 2018. Um, but also I have to really unpack my own reaction to the situation. I know I shouldn't have tapped the brakes, but there was a part of me that wanted to show him like, hey, you shouldn't be doing this to me. Um, so just really, you know, this is something that I experience like on an everyday basis, the kind of the challenge to kind of suppress like these masculine urges or these certain urges. Um, and just like how road rage is just a gendered element, meaning that of course, men and women engage in road rage, but men are more likely to escalate it into violence. And so that got me really thinking about like, where does anger, or what does anger mean? Where does it come from? Next slide. And so looking at this, uh, or using the analogy of an iceberg and anger, anger can be indicative of so many different things. How is someone feeling stressed out, feeling overwhelmed, feeling threatened, feeling contempt, um, this insecurity. And so for men, the only way that men are able to kind of express like certain feelings um, of like anger, often it's just like they could just only express pain and discomfort because that's the socially accepted thing to do. And recent research has suggested that this anger is related to mental health. 
Um, but also anger could be a mask of like other mental health issues that these men are experiencing. Next. And so I call this the visible, invisible public health crisis. And so what do I mean by the visible, invisible public health crisis? Next. So if we unpack some of the statistics, um, violence, speeding, addiction, death, and suicide, we see with the mass shooters, the school shooters, murder offenders, 90% 90 to 95% are men. I mean, when, when we look at speeders, the majority of speeders are men and receiving tickets are men. When we look at substance use disorders, majority of the severe substance use disorders are men. Men die five years younger than women. And as was mentioned by Dr. Fry um, and Do uh, Lorenz Lewis, it was the fact that men are more likely, four times more likely to die of suicide compared to women. So this really kind of highlights that this is like a very gendered issue and especially men's issue. However, and when we even just look at the violence and what the media says about school shootings, they always say, oh, this is a young person's issue. However, this is like a larger issue that just disproportionately impacts men. And so this is a really men's issue. And so, and specifically it's traditional masculinity. And what do I mean by traditional masculinity? Traditional masculinity is the beliefs, expectation of what it means to be a man. And often these beliefs are socialized even before birth. The picture on the uh, lower right screen is a baby, like a baby gender reveal, um, my brother-in-law. And so you could guess what sex of the baby was. But this is just kind of indicative of how we are socializing men or boys or women, women um, at, before birth. Meaning that sometimes like, even like in the womb, people kind of like talk, start talking about like, oh wow, he's a fighter. So he's putting this gender component to the baby, even though the baby's not born. And these gender roles are often formed by like the individual child before the age of four. And our daily interactions are gendered, specifically communication. When men are assertive, it's okay. But then women do the same thing. They're called bossy. In public space, we see mans manspreading, um, especially if we're like traveling on a plane or in a, um, in a train, um, men just kind of take up more physical space. But just even when we look at in the work situation or leadership positions of the top, um, if we look at the top, um, Fortune 500 CEOs, majority of them are men. Or just even in the work setting, um, who's more likely to interrupt others in a work setting? Generally, it's men. Um, also, family roles in heterosexual relationships, we see that women are more likely to bear the burden of just childcare as well as domestic duties. And then finally, with social interactions, we rarely see men talking about their feelings, vulnerabilities in a public setting with other men. Next. And so I'm going to talk about the within group differences, uh, as well as between group, group differences among men. Next. And so I just want to kind of give a background of like my own research. And so for the past 20 years, I've been studying men's issues. Um, and specifically, I started actually with Tupac, and I wrote a paper on Tupac. And this was inspired by my girlfriend at the time, who said that if you want to date me, you have to take a feminist course. And so actually I took two feminist courses. We also like spent hours just talking about masculinity and Tupac and how hip hop rap music has very misogynistic lyrics. But also like during those dialogues, I would talk about how there's like mixed messages and there's different um, expressions of masculinity and specifically Tupac. And that's again, what inspired me to write the paper on Tupac, which was published in the Black Scholar. And now my college girlfriend is my wife slash and a social work professor. Um, I also have like um, was lucky to partner up with some other researchers and we wrote the first uh, culturally responsive counseling It's like an edited book on like, Asian American men's issues, given that this like is a huge issue, um, but often ignored within certain populations, including Asian Americans. I also did a longitudinal study recently because we have found that cross sexually masculine norms are related to mental health, but we want to see how if they predict um, kind of perspective depression. Next slide. And so what do I mean by conformity to masculine norms? So it's not that all men um, have a certain either high, low, medium masculine norms. It's not a monolith or unidimensional. It's multidimensional based off of con some contemporary scholars such as James Mahalik. 
And some of these norms include self-reliance. Self-reliance is like the picture of Ron Swanson uh, from Parks and Rec. Um, he's this independent, makes his own furniture, um, man's man who hunts his own food. And so this is kind of like this, the stereotype of like what a self-reliant man is, but also like winning out at all costs. I mean, this is really embedded within the United States sports culture that even you have to play through injury in order to win. Um, but also we just have like this pressure, or men have this pressure to engage in risk-taking. Um, more risk you take, the more manly you are as well as violence. Violence is justified if it's for, for, for something or someone. Next. Also power of women and dominance, that basically this is talking about the gender hierarchy that men are supposed to be in charge, men are supposed to take care of women, or men are supposed to be dominant. Also the pressures of emotion control, that you're supposed to control your emotions and if you show emotions, you're weak. But also heterosexual presentation for heterosexual men they don't want to be perceived as gay, um, and as well as engage in um, activities that are perceived as feminine, because um, then they won't be seen as masculine. Um, and finally, playboy norm. So playboy norm is uh, sexual prowess. Essentially, you want to sleep with as many women as possible, have a sexual conquest. Next. And so I want to talk about some psychological theories that's based in the psychology of men and masculinity. And so some um, theories that have been proposed is this dysfunction strain theory. And dysfunction strain theory talks about how like men tend to avoid anything that is feminine. However, just having these certain expectations of what it means to be a man are often unrealistic. For example, if you have this winning norm, you know you're not gonna win all the time or most people like will fail. So what do you do in those situations or the breadwinner? So if you have this breadwinner mentality and you lose your job, how are you going to make, how's that going to make you feel as well as self-reliant? So if you have the self-reliant norm, I need to take care of my own business. I don't need anybody's help yet. I'm struggling with depression. How might that impact um, the man? And also if the men have endorsed all these norms at the same time, it can, these men are carrying this huge burden, which obviously takes a huge psychological toll. We also have to talk about discrepancy strain. A lot of times men have this unrealistic expectation of what they mean, like, what it means to be a man um, or the certain ideal, like how they look, they're supposed to be tall, chiseled, uh, smooth talker, suave. Um, and then if you ask them like, you know, what, does, is that consistent with how you perceive yourself? Or then they may say, no, actually I'm short, I'm not smooth. Um, I'm not good at talking with other people and especially women. And when you have that discrepancy between this ideal norms and this real norms yourself, that discrepancy could create this additional strain. And I don't know if like anybody uh, watched the 2016 presidential uh, Republican primary debates, and it was just shocking to see this on the national worldwide stage where you see some of the candidates and actually the former president talking about hand size and how big their hands are, how small one's hands are, you know, little Rubio. I mean, it was adolescent banter to say the least. And it just was very shocking to myself as well as many others. But a lot of times like we think that, oh, masculine norms is just a boys, young adult thing. However, we could see, we saw on the national stage that this is just a man's issue. And this really kind of taps into precarious manhood. And what is precarious manhood? I mean, for men out there, when has your manhood been tested? or threaten. Um, sometimes like you hear these fighting words or just joking words and excuse the language on like the screen. Uh, you're acting like a bitch, you're pussy, you're soft. And basically that's kind of telling the other man that they're smaller, they're feminine. Um, and so then someone has to prove like they're not by engaging in other uh, activities, behaviors that is masculine. Or for men out there, like uh, what do you do if someone pushes you or just respects your significant other in public? Are you just going to like walk away um, and do nothing? Or are you gonna say something back to the other person? So there's this pressure for men to say something back and prove themselves. And this is what's called hard won, easily lost. This requires public proof. This happens in the bar, social settings and uh, sports events where like men get into fights um, and you could just see like you get in a fight, let's say you win, 
you injure the other person while you won the fight. However, you injure the person, you could get sued, and also you could get um, put in jail. Or on the opposite, you get in a fight, you lose, you get hurt. Um, that can impact like your your life forever. So again, there's like no like easy wins. There's always hard won or easily lost. And you even see that just in games or even drinking games. Like, oh, who's going to out drink another person? But obviously, that has a huge consequence, meaning that someone could get food poisoning, or, uh, alcohol poisoning, or um, you know, alcohol related problems, get drinking um, while intoxicated and, and driving. But this really kind of also taps into this gender threat. And what I mean by gender threat is that there has been some experimental studies, really innovative and experimental studies, highlighting how when men are uh, feminized or uh, emasculated, they tend to respond uh, more aggressively, as well as engage in riskier behavior and engage in poor decision making. Next slide. And so what is the empirical evidence in this area? And so what the research says, and there's been some actually really interesting review papers um, that was published by Wong um, and others that really highlight the masculine norms that I talked about, um, self-reliance, playboy, power of women, emotion and control are all strong predictors of depression and anxiety for men. Um, this is across numerous studies Winning, violence, and dominance are also related, but just generally there's sometimes mixed uh, findings or small effects with winning, violence, and dominance. And interestingly, uh, winning and risk-taking sometimes is protective. So some studies it shows as a risk factor, and other studies it shows it might be protective. And you can see with risk-taking, because risk-taking could be seen as like a, something that's positive, uh, meaning that it's like you're trying new opportunities. Um, so that could also then prevent you know, one from experiencing like depression. And so on my research also kind of focused on uh, masculine norms and health among diverse men, such as Asian American and African American white men. And generally our findings are consistent with the review papers that are out there. Self-reliance dominance is related to poor mental health, winning is protective. But interestingly, it's like the risk-taking playboy and self-reliance are risk factors of substance use. Of course, risk-taking, it makes sense. If you have that mindset, you're going to engage in more risky behavior. So that's just, uh, kind of obvious finding. However, it's just interesting playboy norm is a really robust predictor of the substance use. And what we believe is that, you know, in men who endorse this playboy norm may feel the need to engage, if they want to have multiple sexual partners, they might feel like, oh, I have to drink alcohol to give me this liquid courage, or alcohol is going to make me more sexual. Um, so that might heighten the risk for these men who endorse this playboy norm to engage in alcohol use as well as substance use. And self-reliance too. So why self-reliance uh, predictor of substance use? And this kind of makes sense when that if you have self-reliance norms, maybe you're engaging in the self-medication or negative reinforcement um, if you have those type of attitudes. Next. And so Lorenzo already did a brilliant job talking about some of the intersectionalities and distinct challenges that African-American men face. Um, and also just, you know, just thinking about like, you know, this work and other with diverse populations, this ideal man often excludes racial minority men. Um, men of color experience additional pressures and this additional pressures is termed gendered racism, meaning that there's kind of this intersectionality between racism as well as masculinity. Um, and this is really evident with the stereotypes of black men. Black men are perceived or stereotyped as aggressive, hypersexual, hypermasculine. And we see the consequence of that. Police are more likely to um, arrest them as well as use um, you know, excessive force with black men compared to others. Um, but also, you know, let's think about just when we think about who's hot, who's hot, like attractive male. What are some like your thoughts that first come out, like first come up, pop up in your head? Anybody? Who's a hot male? You could put that in chat. Or even leader, like let's say just even a leader, like who comes up to mind? Man, you're from Mike Riff, Brad Pitt, Chris Hemingsworth, exactly. And so who's left out of this is Asian American men. So Asian American, yeah, George Clooney is another one. Asian American men are emasculated and the research suggests that Asian American men are the least attractive men out there. Meaning that, you know, people prefer other groups but Asian American men rate the last. Um, and also people perceive Asian American men uh, as well as just Asian Americans as like the like not leadership materials. And again, this is reflective in the leadership positions in the United States. 
And so what's some of the translational application? Next slide. So Dr. Frey um, and Dean Olmstein um, have talked about this um, already. Um, Dr. Frey is like doing some really innovative work and just kind of the evaluation of the man's therapy, which really kind of shows how when you have like a male-centered or gender-relevant uh, intervention, that could be definitely effective. Um, so one thing that clinicians, I really want clinicians to kind of think about, and many of you already have, is really kind of exploring this flexible masculinity with your men, with men in therapy. And even asking the simple question of like, you know, what is your definition of a man? Most men have not thought about that in, like, in a deep way, or how do you fit with this certain ideal? Um, and you can also just even like use measures of masculinity to start talking about some of these issues. I talked about the conformity of masculine norms. That's a free inventory. You can use that with your clients to start exploring some of these issues, but also like exploring like pros and cons. What, you know, what are some pros about certain masculine norms? For example, like, oh yeah, winning. Yeah, of course it's good to like have this winning norm because, you know, you have this drive to win. Um, you could just overcome like barriers. Also emotional control. Emotional control could be good at times meaning that emotional control, like in relationships, that might not be great to have this emotional control, um, but then in an emergency situation, that could be very beneficial. Um, so just kind of tap, like just going, exploring each masculine norm with some of these men could kind of see both the pros and cons, but also see like, some of the faulty thinking like with self-reliance. So if a man feels like, oh, I need to be a breadwinner, I need to be self-reliant, but they're experiencing depression, like how might like that self-reliance be impeding upon like their aspirations to be a breadwinner. Um, and also just the pros and cons really gets at the motivational interviewing, which has been found to be really effective in treating alcohol use disorders. But also I think clinicians really need to think about their both explicit and implicit biases and their perceptions of male. A lot of times like clinicians tend to focus on externalizing problems with men, such as anger or addiction. But we know based off the research that there are a lot of co-occurring disorders from like this externalizing behaviors and internalizing behaviors such as depression or anxiety. There's this co-occurrence that happens. So kind of really kind of looking into this co-occurrence and not just treating the externalizing behaviors. Next. And so this was really kind of talking about like this call to action and redefining masculinity because it impacts all of us. And so we have to really kind of think about like how we contribute to maintaining traditional masculinity. And this is like some like a, just a general awareness of like checking what we say, uh, questioning others or even judging others. I mean, sometimes like with women or just like we hear like critique about, oh, this woman looks sloppy uh, or like she looks messy or disheveled. Um, and that's obviously seen as a negative, but we don't say that to men. I mean, look at Einstein. Einstein was like really disheveled and had a super messy office, but we kind of look over that with men, but we kind of focus that as an attribute for women or focus on what they wear like with women. And we saw that again with the presidential in 2016, where Hillary was really kind of reamed for like what she was wearing at times. Also a little term such as big boys don't cry. Uh, we need to like basically start fostering um, little boys to kind of start like talking about their feelings, about talking about vulnerabilities, and that's okay to express your emotions. But also, boys will be boys. That saying is, I hear that all the time, and it drives me nuts. It's like, what does that mean? So it's okay for boys to be aggressive and girls not to be aggressive, and we have to really kind of talk, like think about like how boys will be boys is really reinforcing this aggressive behavior with men or boys. And also just like having this gender binary and um, it's really obviously limiting to both boys, men um, and girls and women. Um, I mean, we list unlock the full potential of you know, everybody. And finally, I think that this, this presentation really highlighted the key issues why this is such a huge crisis. But I think having this awareness and accepting even our own responsibility to this can really foster change. Next. So again, I wanna thank the University of Utah, Dean Osteen, um, Dr. Frey, um, as well as my um, undergrads who helped me with my PowerPoint presentation. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but they were definitely helpful. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Derek. I really appreciate that. And, and that crosses over so much of what we've already heard today and what we see in the literature. Um, so I do want to acknowledge, I know Mr. Lewis will have to pop off to another call, so please feel free to do that when you need to, sir, um, but also feel free to stay around as long as you can. We greatly, greatly appreciate your contribution today. 
um, in helping us with this uh, conversation. So thank you so much for joining us. So I want to, I've been taking notes. So again, I want to encourage the audience to put questions in the Q&A. Um, we have nearly 150 people. So just open air questions is not going to work. That will be a little challenging. So drop those in there and we'll get to them as we can. But two of the comments, um, I think, really play into what uh, you've all talked about. And the first one being, you know, how does our approach to working with men around mental health and well-being differ across racial and ethnic lines? And then the follow-up question was, well, how does this work um, when so much of this work, it seems grounded sort of in heteronormative um, uh, of ways of, of working with men. So what does that have uh, meaning for, for queer uh, men, transgender men, things like that? So um, I don't know if you want to sort of take a global stab at that, or if you want to sort of take on each of those separately. Well, I responded a little bit in the chat. Um, I think it's very important to think about the approach connecting with the population that you're trying to reach out to. And so from the man therapy standpoint, again, I'm not paid for them, paid by them, I didn't create it, but I like to study it. Um, men want to see men that look like them and whose issues resonate with them and helpful measures, helpful um messages that recovery is possible. Um, and, and that I think is across the board, but how we do that, you know, really we need to be um, very thoughtful in our approach. And so, you know, Dean Osteen, when you and I looked at the man therapy data and 20% of our population identified as queer, bisexual, um, or gay, we were very surprised actually to see that men who used man therapy in that group actually had significant greater improvement on suicide ideation and depression using man therapy. And we tried to get a grant several times to be able to call and do qualitative interviews because we knew it only went so far. Like what was it about man therapy that was different than something else? Or was this the only strategy that, you know, someone was trying to use in the community? And we knew it wasn't the end all in terms of public health approaches. And unfortunately that grant wasn't funded. So it left us with more questions but I knew I do know, like over working with man therapy for almost 10 years, our partners have been saying we need more diversity, we need we need more inclusion, and man therapy is grant funded itself. So they, you know, we're luckily able to get a significant grant now for their 10 year um anniversary. And they are putting out man therapy 3.0. It's supposed to be out in November, which will have an entirely Spanish um, version and lots more inclusion with subject matter experts talking about updating the information, the material, um, as well as being more inclusive to diverse men um, and thinking about being able to have different versions of rich mahogany. We found out from our partners that sometimes the message resonates, but not Rich, you know, Dr. Rich. And so some of our partners have taken out that image as the front line to reaching out to someone, but using the content and the message. So I think we have to be flexible with our approaches and very um, sensitive to recognizing that one approach isn't going to work for everybody. Um, but certainly uh, for for men that are at greater risk, particularly um, trans and queer men, we know have much higher rates of suicide there is very little research that tells us what those best practices are. I see Lorenzo had to leave, but. Yeah, and again, it's just another thank you, Tam, for it's very, very, very creative, interesting work. And so I encourage everybody to go check out um, his website for more information about that. I think there's a lot that could be expanded um, from what he's learned and what he's done. So, Derek, I mean, sort of pick up from your conversation, your presentation about the different ways maybe in which men sort of express their need uh, for support. And, you know, Jody and I have worked on this as well, but I really love that you tapped in on this idea of anger is sort of this global um, manifestation of all kinds of different things that men have been experienced. So for you, do you, do you see those manifestations differing uh, across racial or ethnic lines or across uh, gender to orientation lines? Or do you think there's a more global presentation, but maybe more um, uh, individualized intervention, if that makes sense? I think that's a great 
question. I think that it, anger can be exacerbated. And of course, like there's that research that's really linking anger to like depression uh, for men, uh, more so than women or individuals who identify as women. Um, however, I think that there's definitely this intersectionality of like just even anger and discrimination or racism and how just like this could really kind of exacerbate like why certain minority groups, African-American, Asian-American men, like why there's like kind of this even like greater like anger and animosity towards like various systems. Um, but this could also like relate to the uh, LGBTQ plus community as well. Um, I mean, for gay men, I mean, you have like this like double jeopardy or even triple jeopardy if you're not only a gay male, um, but also um, a minority. Um, so it just, again, like you could have that, just the, the, like the, the sexual minority stigma on top of racism, on top of like the men's issues that could exacerbate this anger. So I think that, you know, obviously it's such a complex and we're still really trying to unpack this. Um, and I think the future work really examine kind of this intersectionality, both with sexual, um, identity, racial identity. Uh, the anger, you know, the anger thing made me, you know, see, uh, the anger made me think about, you know, some of what we were looking at in the man therapy study. And, um, you know, we started off that study, we didn't really have a measure of anger or irritability and very quickly worked with the CDC to add that because of the way men experience and or report depression. You know, a lot of our depression questionnaires and surveys focus on, you know, withdrawal and feeling blue and, and sad. And we know from our research with men that, you know, depression can look really different or be understood differently. And so in some of the data, you know, again, not yet published, hopefully soon. Um, but we, you know, one thing that I think was so important from a clinical perspective is that about 12% of our men in the the large screening sample, the, the, the 2000, you know, plus men that we screened throughout the state reported moderate and high um, irritability and anger and also suicide ideation without depression. And so I think about like my clinical training and practice, a lot of times, you know, we're taught to, you know, go into a more comprehensive assessment of suicide when there's depression. But if we're asking about depression, in a way that doesn't reflect or resonate with how someone may be experiencing it or reporting it, we're potentially losing, you know, an opportunity to have a conversation about suicide risk with someone that's sitting right in front of us. So I, I do think, you know, for men being at such, you know, high risk, we we really don't understand a lot in our research about how to connect and how to work with men. Um, you know, I'm, I also, you know, think from the clinical perspective, like I love Derek, when you were talking about, you know, working with clients, like asking, what does being a man mean to you? From a therapist perspective, we come in also with our biases of what it means to work with a man. Um, and so from the man therapy perspective, a lot of women have gone to the site and they're so thankful for it because it helps them have different ways to communicate with men in their life that they just weren't, you know, speaking the same language and, and, and really didn't know how to connect and support loved ones in their lives. So I think we also have to look at those masculinity norms and biases ourselves as friends, families, and therapists of like, what are, what are we coming into this relationship expecting, um, while also encouraging someone to be forthcoming about their feelings and their emotions. Are we ready to hear that, to receive that, and to be comfortable um, with that communication as well? Yeah, um, I got a great question here. I'm gonna break it down into two points. The first one, uh, it says, it seems like pointing at masculinity as the problem sends a message that you're messed up or could lead to men pulling back or hiding emotions. It's just, what thoughts do you have about that? I mean, I think that this kind of gets at, um, and why I was just really kind of struggling with my title. Um, so I say toxic masculinity, hyper masculinity, and that's why she's kind of unmasking masculinity. I think that we, we don't want to like shy away from masculinity. And like I said, that there's certain masculine norms can be very beneficial in certain circumstances. 
um, like I said, the emotion control or even the winning norm. I think that all of us, I mean, especially in academia, have like a winning norm. Like we want to like, you know, get the grants, get the publications, right? And so just really kind of understand like when we can code switch, um, like when is it good to have a winning norm? When is it kind of not optimal? When is it good to have emotional control? When is it not optimal? So like having that flexibility. So I'm not saying that masculinity is bad. It's just like, we just have to be more flexible about it. And that's not a bad word. And that's why I didn't put toxic masculinity. And I would agree. I mean, I, I think a lot of times, you know, when folks learn about my research, they're like, what, you're a woman. Why are you, why are you studying like men's mental health? Like, it's not, it's not your issue. I'm like, well, it's, it is our issue. It is a woman's issue. Actually, it's a society issue. And I think it's very important to recognize norms, whether they be societal, whether they be something that's internal. Um, we all, we all come with them. We come with expectations um, and being able, as Derek said, to be flexible, to change the narrative, to have conversations is so important. Uh, someone asked like, what should we do to, to do this work better? Like listen and ask questions and, and constantly learn um, because it's really, when we don't ask the questions in a way that opens up conversations, that's when I find clients and just friends and people shy away from talking openly, especially with just basic suicide prevention practices. You know, but a lot of us out there were probably trained to ask questions like, you're not suicidal, are you? And that tells someone you're not a safe person for me to share that actually I am. So I think, you know, when we think about opening conversations about stigmatized issues in general, that we have to be flexible and really open to encourage conversation and be ready for whatever we're gonna hear. Yeah, and it's it's so interesting to me when we think about norms, frequently gendered, right? And you can think about having this winning attitude, which can be have positive influence, right? It can have negative influences. But if we were talking about women sometimes having winning attitudes, right? it's rarely seen in a positive light. And so it's it's interesting that we have to gender norms when really these types of attitudes can be can be healthy or unhealthy across gendered, right? Um, so this leads to the second part of that question. And it says, I wonder what needs masculine norms actually fulfill for people? And how would you fulfill those needs if we were to break down masculine norms? Hmm. Can you repeat the first part of the question again? I missed sure. It. Um, it says that I wonder what needs, like for a person, that masculine norms actually fulfill for them. And then how would you fulfill those needs if you were to break down masculine stereotypes and norms? I'm going to defer to Tarek on the first part on this one. I mean, I think that, I mean, as we discussed, I mean, a lot of these norms are developed based off social norms, kind of these expectations, societal messages, like what we receive from the media, what we receive from our family, from the various institutions. I mean, these are things that are just constantly being bombarded. Again, as I mentioned, like even before birth. And so I think that, I mean, that's what's kind of really feeding into like these norms or even reinforcing these norms. We see this on the TV and like, oh, this is what an ideal man or even woman should look like. Um, I need to live up to that. Um, so I think that's like, I mean, I would say this is more of kind of societal and just like it's we're again constantly bombarded. And I think that, you know, this type of presentation is bringing about this awareness to kind of see like uh, take a step back and like, wow, gender norms do really influence how I think behave. Um, what can I do with this? Yeah. And I think when I look at that, too, and I agree is that, you know, socially, we're giving given this message of what like the ideal man should be. Right. And men want to be seen as that person and that is that's the need that it fulfills the sense of connection a sense of recognition or respect that i'm i'm part of that group right mm -hmm. um because because i represent what we consider to be ideal and then the question then becomes well how do you fulfill this need to be connected and seen as uh you know part of a group and and strong and I don't know that, I mean, we can work on that at the individual level, but like you said, that's a societal message, right? We have to, we have to come to recognize that there are other strengths that men can aspire to that are positive, right? And that they don't have to always fall into what we would consider stereotypical norms. 
And on the counter side, like what we think about as stereotypical norms for men, as you mentioned, like when women, you know, and other folks have some of these traits, we don't see them in the same light. And so I think normalizing traits and, you know, what people can be is, is an important conversation to have. And, you know, I think also, because I do so much work in the workplace, I think about some of the more what we think like toxic traits, but also, you know, given what we're learning about the unmasked mask, <laughs> I think that Derek was saying in his slides, I, I have to go back to that, but I really liked what you were presenting. The way we express ourselves it sometimes is really a mask for a different way of how we're feeling. So, you know, I, I started my work before suicide prevention and violence prevention in the workplace. And oftentimes, you know, it was someone who was male that we, you know, saw that was irritable in the workplace. And, you know, that often, you know, would be the case when there was an incident of workplace violence. But if you peel back the onion a little bit, you find there's a lot of complex issues and emotions that are often happening. And when we're in the workplace, like if someone was depressed, people are coming with caring messages and how can I help you? How can I support you? Can I make you dinner? When someone's angry and irritable and violent, you know, we're working on firing them from the workplace. And like, how can, how can we safely have this person leave, you know, without violence when maybe at the core, they're struggling with the same thing. So I, I think, you know, the way that we respond to different expressions of emotion is also very complicated in norms and and prevents us from having communication about who our authentic self is and could be. Yeah, and it and it further complicates the issue, I think, when when we really do dive in and start to think about people who are on the gender gender spectrum, right? Who may consider to be transgendered or non-binary those social messages are already playing into them into into their experiences of mental health and well-being as well and it just sets up this sort of continuing roll down and, and Derek I think you talked about sort of the you know triple threat or I can't remember the exact uh, term that you were using but right how how it's just so challenging right there, there really are no norms right most people don't actually win all the time like you said right like it's just this ideal that we, we've decided that's an ideal that most people are not getting to um but they like to pretend that they do so i'm going to move to a second question um which i think jody you touched on just a little bit so the question is in social work particularly public child welfare which was in this individual's field i'd guess 80 percent are female when women are charged with the responsibility of working with men and attempting to have them be receptive to mental health treatment, what are thoughts about how women can do that? And, and I might even brought a little bit to the idea of what what can you know what what can partners do? Well, I know you know as I mentioned from the man therapy research that we've been looking at. A lot of women tell us that it's very helpful to explore the site, to think about how a man in their life might be thinking differently about depression or suicide um, than they are. And it, it opens up opportunities for conversation. Like we did a whole um, e-Valentine card campaign um, that was very successful um, in Michigan and then also in Rhode Island we did recently uh, where people could send an e-card to someone they cared about that had kind of a message in the flavor of man therapy that encouraged folks to seek help and it you know it wasn't necessary it was like I'm trying to think of one. Oh, yeah, I don't know if Erica's still on to, to post one but like one was like I, I wish you look at me the way you look at you know sizzling bacon and it would have like a sizzling bacon meme on it um and again just like a way to grab attention to enter into having a conversation i think that's like the hardest part is how do you even approach the subject in a way that allows for conversation to happen and so making sure you know for social workers that they're 
receiving training in best practices. Oh, there, Erica is on. She put, I, I don't know if everyone could op open the Google Drive for the Michigan Project, but you can see some there. Thank you, Erica. Um, I, I think it's important that we don't rely on like how we were trained many years ago. You know, I've been in the field now for 25 years as a clinician and we're just learning really what works in the field of suicide prevention. It's, you know, there hasn't been a lot of funding and attention to this area, despite it being, you know, one of the um, leading causes of death throughout our country for decades. So I think, you know, one thing for social workers is to continue to get training, to continue to get consultation and be open to thinking about different strategies that maybe you didn't learn in school that could have some value. I never learned about man therapy in school. I didn't actually learn that humor was important in my clinical work. Um, and I have found that that connection you know, when we think of the importance of social isolation as a risk factor for suicide and lack of connection um, and feeling hopeless, like that opportunity to just be present with someone and enter the conversation differently than how you've been trained is so critical, you know, regardless of gender or anything else. Um, because you might be the person who's sitting with someone on the worst day of their life, and you might be the last person that they're willing to try to talk to. So we have to really make sure we bring our best self to that clinical setting and, and offer questions that provide a safe place for anyone to, to talk with us. So a quick follow-up to the question about um, societal norms, which was, in your opinion, do you think society's generation of these norms is really meant to equip men with tools for success, or is it really about trying to sell products to men who can't live up to this ideal in an attempt to reach that ideal? I mean, I think that some of these norms that are, um, the, or the messages that we are receiving, I mean, it's definitely, you know, there is a, it's not doom and gloom and like, you know, hopeless. I mean, I think that there are kind of more flexible notions of masculinity um, now. And we see that with some of the research emerging that young adult men have a more flexible notions of masculinity. And of course, like, yeah, I think that's still, um, we see it in like the commercials. It's still kind of very male centered or woman centered. Um, or women identify centered. Um, so I think that we just, again, need to kind of continue to kind of question certain things and have, again, like more of these dialogues um, to really kind of challenge these certain norms. And even just like kind of going back to one of the other questions about like, you know, this ideal versus real. I mean, sometimes like, you know, how do we achieve this ideal? And again, I think it's just the flexibility. Like, why do we have to use this definition of ideal? What is your like, like kind of ideal? What is like kind of normative for you what's like important for you kind of like making it very like centered to the clients kind of like oh you know feelings like expressing my feelings that's a good thing so kind of expressing that um and showing that hey that it can be a part of like what like a real man it does for you and that's really important and encouraging that i got an interesting response um our study was um in the new york times and um so I had an interview about the man therapy research. And of course, you know, like after you talk on an interview for an hour, they pick, you know, two seconds of the segment that is going to be on the news. And it was really, you know, focused on, um, you know, kind of how man therapy is a, a connector for help seeking and in that public health, health space of the initial communication and connection. And I got an email right away from someone um, who saw that segment and it just reminded me of what Derek was saying, you know, with changing norms about help seeking. And the person was like, I really wish you had talked about the broken mental health system because I tried, you know, for six months plus to get a therapist appointment. Not all of us that are guys don't want to do therapy. Like some of us are ready. We're, really, we're ready to go and we want to try this. And then there's nobody accepting any new patients. So I think, you know, I was like, oh, I totally understand you know, what you're talking about. And, and I wish that more of that segment had aired to tell the whole story. But I think even, you know, within, you know, some of the gender specific interventions and strategies we're using, there's 
a huge, you know, variation of where people are on the help seeking spectrum. And, um, you know, that that's something that I've wondered about, like for man therapy, I'm like, sometimes when guys are searching, you know, on the site and they're ready for help, it's hard to find the resources. Like, how do we get back there? So, so in our research, we've been also providing feedback to the creators of in this particular intervention, man therapy, and then they are able to hear the feedback from the community. So they're, they've been revamping so that when you're, you know, searching, like maybe I'm, you know, worried about anxiety or stress, and then now I'm ready to get a resource. Like, where is it? You know, and forget it. I can't find it. And they're going to log off the site. So they've included making resource cards for folks that are like, yeah, I'm, re I'm ready to go. So I, I think it's important you know, in our strategy, whether it's in person or we're trying these online techniques to be ready to help when the person is is ready for help and, and to be able to offer that um, up front without having to wait for someone to reach out. Um, because when someone's ready, you know, they need to have that help available. And, and that certainly is a whole other challenge to thinking about, you know, going back, I think to Don's question, like who's ready to work with men and comfortable working with men? How, how do we get our training? And then also in terms of our crisis response, making sure that when someone's ready on these interventions, that that help is easily accessible and ready for them. So a question about stigma for you. Um, we talk a lot about stigma being one of the major challenges to men uh, seeking out mental health, health, well-being um, services. Do you think that is more prominent among men than it is maybe among other groups who are trying to access or who are, are reticent to access services? Like, is there a difference in sort of our approach to promoting help seeking? Maybe that's a better way to put it. A difference in approach for how we promote overall to men and women? To, to men, right? So I guess I'm now starting to say, do do we need to use different techniques to get men into the system, right? Versus that we made for other groups. I mean, based on the research that we're doing for some men, yes. Um, different techniques seem to work um, better than others, but I'm, I'm not going to generalize to all men. Um, I think that you know, we've had men that go on man therapy that have told us, you know, I get it, but like, it didn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. um, we also have had men that are already in counseling or have been in counseling before that, again, they're like, I didn't really find this helpful because I already knew a lot of this information but maybe it was a reminder to re-engage. So I think, you know, even like what the intervention is designed to do, like with man therapy is help seeking um, and to reduce intensity, people find different benefits at different levels. Um, you know, whereas other men have written and said, this saved my life. You know, the fact that I was able to access this in three in the morning, it saved my life. Um, so I, I think it's important to have a lot of different strategies and to, to not rely on one type of messaging or public health approach, because there's no way that one approach is going to reach everybody. So going back, you know, to the, it's not this or that, it's this and that. I, I think that is so critically important in this field because you know, if man therapy as a free online website is able to help someone to the point where they feel like it saved their life, like we should be using all of the tools that are out there that are available to us, but we shouldn't limit to make any kind of assumption that rich mahogany or man therapy is going to work for everybody because it doesn't. And, and I don't think we should have that expectation that we're going to find the right intervention for everybody. Yeah, picking up on that point, Dr. Fry brought up is the fact that, yeah, there's, I think, different ways and different strategies in which, like, we could reach out to men. I think that there's been, like, a more newer campaign with, like, Michael, Phillip, or Michael Phelps, um, him, getting, him talking about his struggles with depression. Um, and there's, I guess, some evidence that that has been so, somewhat successful. Um, but we also have to kind of think about minoritized groups, I mean, specifically 
men of color or even like communities of color. I mean, I teach Asian American psychology to undergrads and so many of them talk about the stigma of just counseling just for Asian American communities as well as other minority, minority communities. So I think we definitely have to also reach out to these communities, hopefully have like spokespeople on these communities to kind of create these kind of normative social norms about therapy and even talking about like what to expect in therapy. Um, Cause I think a lot of times people think about, oh, it's just lying on the couch and talking to some, shr uh, some shrink. Um, but it's beyond that, you know, you just do strength building um, with just kind of like mental strength or just, you know, stress reduction or even like improvement, um, kind of like just normalizing what the therapy um, entails. And even just like with my own experience, I, I share with my students about like my, um, me going to therapy and how like, you know, I just do this sometimes just to center myself. Um, initially it was for grief, but then, you know, now it's kind of centering myself for presentations or when I have a grant due. Um, it could just be used to really take your work to the next level. And I think a lot of times many people don't realize that. Yeah, so I want to be mindful of time. I have like a whole list of questions in here. Um, and so if I don't read yours, please don't take that personally. Um, I'm going to go with this one, which the individual says, thinking about my general practitioner's office and how they do mental health screenings and, and you know, could always do more. It says, it seems like it's only about four or five questions that we're using, and they're not really tailored to a person's gender identity. So suggestions or thoughts for how do we get that change at an institutional level? This is a hard question. Um, I do work with uh, zero suicide programs, and some of the some of the biggest challenges on an institutional level is like how to even get any screening questions into the conversation. Um, so, you know, the majority, I, I just did a presentation last week. It's suicide prevention month, so I've been busy with presentations, but um, I did one last week to about 35 professionals, clinicians, and I thought it was gonna be very, um, repetitive of like, what kind of screening measures are you using? Only three were actually using screening measures at a pretty large institution. So I, I do think it's important to use screening measures and many of them are generalized and to use them as screening to open up conversation for a more uh, nuanced and, and robust dialogue and conversation. And so I teach suicide assessment and response to social workers, and we start with screening, but it's only a starting place. And I think that's a very important piece is to institutionalize the screening, but recognizing screening, you know, only goes so far. And we know majority of people, you know, are not, um, you know, going to, their, their suicide intensity isn't necessarily going to be captured by a simple screening. So it really has to be a place of foundation that we then build in additional questions. So it could be like Derek mentioned, the conformity to masculinity inventory, like using different tools to open up conversation, I think can be really helpful in clinical practice, but bringing that into an institutional level more than even just bringing in the screening is definitely moving some mountains. Yeah. Any thoughts, Derek, you'd like to share on that? Yeah, I think that um, Dr. Fry kind of mentions some of the things. I'm thinking, yeah, for any institution, it's really hard, especially if you're kind of limited to the number of items. I mean, I think that is really important. I mean, if we're talking about like kind of men's issues and if we feel like we're going to gear towards like men, I mean, even simple screening about like kind of the anger, irritability, kind of things that are not quite really quite traditionally um, kind of components of the depression. Um, I think another kind of a question that someone had um, was like the conformity mask and norms, where do you find that inventory? You can always shoot me an email and I will send you the conformity mask and norms inventory. Um, and then also what, you know, Dr. Fry mentioned is that there are other measures, not only the conformity mask and norms, but there's like uh, masculine depression measures that are out there. Again, um, if you have any questions or will like that reference, feel free to send um, and me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you. Absolutely. Um, so again, as we come to the end, I just want to share my uh, extreme gratitude for, you know, Dr. Iwamoto to Dr. Fry to Mr. Lewis for being here and sharing uh, such great content, innovation, strategies. 
Um, thank you so much uh, for that. And thank you to everybody who joined us either today live during the presentation or who is watching this. I hope that you found value in this um, and that this is something that you can take back and, and think about in terms of your own practice. So the College of Social Work is committed to the long-term work of recognizing and dismantling racism and interrelated oppressions with the goal of supporting a just, equitable, and inclusive society. And one of the ways we do that is in our dedication to the speaker series, which is really our effort to address the grand challenges for social work. So for those of you who are attending and seeking suicide prevention continuation, continuing education hours, please watch your email. So you should get something in the next few days it has a link to the recorded presentation, but it also has a brief quiz. And once you successfully complete that quiz, then the CEU certificate will be emailed to you. We welcome everyone to join us throughout the academic year as we delve into many more evidence-based research presentations addressing the major challenges our society is facing. Please visit the college's events page for more information. And again, thank you all for being here for this conversation. I encourage you to go out, to be kind, to be well, Take care of yourself and take care of others. I'm really grateful for everyone being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.